Okay, everybody, hello. Uh, welcome to our fourth webinar in our Learning About Lake Huron series. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to see so many people still coming out to the webinars, even though things are reopening up. Today's topic is throwing shade, the right plants for your coastal environment. So this is a question we get all the time uh, from our Coast Watcher volunteers and just general public uh, requests for information. So hopefully, I'll be able to answer some of your questions uh, as we go along. So if you haven't heard of the Coastal Center before, we were founded in 1998 with the goals of protecting and restoring Lake Huron's coastal environment and promoting a healthy coastal ecosystem. So we're a non-government, non-for-profit charitable organization. Uh, we run programs through donations from people like you, our lake lovers and our coastal citizens, and through um, sponsorships that we earn for our programs. And these allow us to do things like beach cleanups, shoreline restoration programs like our Green Urban Champion program, community workshops and education events like this uh, webinar series through Coast Watchers and Green Ribbon Champion, and even our new youth program, which we are launching next month, uh, the Coastal Conservation Youth Corps. So thank you to our funders uh, who are supporting our Coast Watcher Citizen Science Program and our Green Ribbon Champion Program this year. They're Bruce Power, Nuclear Waste Management Organization, and TD Friends of the Environment Foundation. So thank you so much for your generosity. So in order to uh, tell you what plants are best for your coastal environment, um, it's hard without doing a site assessment, but you can do your own site assessment pretty easily. So today we're gonna learn um, how to assess your ecosystem profile. So this is created through your soil substrate, the plant hardiness zones that you're in and the climate that you experience, and then wave action and, and uh, your shoreline profile that way. So we're gonna just start at you know a thousand foot level and then work our way down. So the soil zones in Ontario are drastically different, especially around Lake Huron. So if you see at the bottom of the screen in Southern Ontario, we have um, a very um, erodible shoreline, glacial till, things that were left over from the glaciers. Um, it's dominated by clay, silt and sand. Whereas as you move up into the Cambrian Shield, we get into that bedrock substrate and um, more organic type um, sub substrates that uh, are conducive for coastal wetlands. So the plant hardiness zone that you're in also affects what kind of plants will grow and succeed, especially perennially in your area. So uh, Lake Huron shoreline again is very diverse. If you've ever heard of plant hardiness zones, when you're buying a plant from a nursery, it'll say uh, zone 12 to 6. And this means that it can survive in uh, lower states. And then as we move up, we get into uh, these smaller zone numbers. So in uh, the lower basin here, we have 6, 6A, and then up along the North Shore, 5A, and even up into the 4s as we go north. So this, uh, growing the amount of growing degree days that we have also affects what plants will grow so um, if you're buying from a nursery it's good to know what plant zone you are so you can see how long that plant uh, will hopefully survive in your garden so these plant hardiness zones also affect the forest zones in canada and the great lakes basin so in this diagram we see the southern great lakes forest are down here. This is also called the Carolinian zone, which we'll talk about. And then the uh, the Bruce Peninsula, Manitoula Island, and even over here into Penetanguishene area is the Eastern Great Lakes lowland forests. So these have a different composition again, a little bit colder tolerant species. And then the North Shore and uh, Eastern Georgian Bay, we have the Eastern Forest Boreal Transition. So you're seeing a lot more conifers and snow tolerant species, plants that can take um, more of a snow load in the winter. So the province of Ontario divides these kind of growing regions, these forest zones in, into ecozones um, and ecoregions. So the definition among those are the Carolinian zone down here is called 7E and then this Great Lakes region is called 6E and then up into that northern boreal transition zone is called 5E. 
and I'll talk a little bit about those here. So it's important to know what, what eco-region you are in too if you want to get down into the, the nitty-gritty. So the province of Ontario defines these eco-zones, 5E, so we're starting up on the north shore of, of Lake Huron and eastern Georgian Bay with these kind of characteristics in, of trees and wildlife. So white pine, red pine, eastern hemlock, yellow birch, sugar maple, black spruce. These are all uh, tree species that can take a snow load. They like to grow in dense stands and um, they support these megafauna species like the eastern wolf, moose, black bear, and even um, other really cool migratory bird species as they move north. If you've ever been to Algonquin Park, that's a great example of this ecoregion and Killarney is another amazing um, example right on Lake Huron's shore. 6E, so we're looking at Penetanguishene, Manitoulin Island, the Bruce Peninsula, and then even down uh, up to Grand Bend. You will have uh, characteristic tree species like sugar maple, beech, white ash, obviously, White ash is a little bit harder to come by now that the ash borer has gone through. Uh, hemlock, white cedar, uh, and so we have more of a mixed forest of conifers and deciduous trees. And they support some megafauna species, but less than the uh, transition boreal zone, like white-tailed deer. We get the odd black bear down in this region. But then we have coyotes, we don't have wolves anymore, and then um, other kind of, Carolinian type transition species like cardinals, um, spring peepers, and um, white-tailed deer. And then into the Carolinian zone, the deep south of Ontario. Uh, this is zone 7E and characteristic tree species and wildlife are sugar maple, beech, white ash, eastern hemlock, and white pine. Um, this is a zone that has some really cool rare species like Kentucky coffee tree, um, sassafras, which is another cool one, tulip tree, uh, really unique southern species grow in this region. And so there's a lot of protected areas, especially um, in prairie type woodland environments. So not as many uh, megafauna live down here just because of the high development and density of humans in this area. So white-tailed deer, obviously. Uh, raccoons and um, there's some actually really cool rare amphibians and reptiles that live uh, down in this region too uh, including the the spiny softshell turtle which is um, very famous in the Thames River in London but uh, the five line skink also is a rare species that exists down near Pinery um, area so some really uh, unique wildlife all throughout each region. So if you want to go deeper down the rabbit hole in this um, eco zone, figuring out your ecotype, there is a really cool uh, guide that was created by an ecologist out of London, Harold Lee and uh, his associates, and they developed the ecological land classification guide for Southern Ontario. So you can go through this, look at the different soil types, climate, and species that are existing naturally in your environment and get your ecosystem code. So I have a copy of this book here and I actually don't know, I think you can buy it online, but it was published uh, through the Ministry of Natural Resources. Mine is from 2010 and it's done a lot of field seasons. So it's a little bit beaten up, but uh, it gets down into the nitty gritty into keys. So you can see in my book here, you can go all the way down into your key. So here we have an example of a dry cedar, calcareous shallow coniferous forest type. And it tells you the species that are dominant here. Uh, this is kind of a Tobermory area type example with white cedar dominant, often represents second growth arising from heavily managed or grazed disturbed sites, canopy cover varies, and then serviceberry, bush honeysuckle, low sweet blueberry, bracken fern, Wildflower saparilla. So anyway, you can go through these type of guides and then get your code. So this is code FOCS3. Um, if you're in the Tobermory area again, this is another example with limestone and do dolostone. It fizzes with acid, high, high pH. Um, this is a, a treed shoreline area with calcareous bedrock. Um, so it, it tells you kind of what uh, what sediment to expect and then what plants are associated. Tree cover less than 25%. And then if you're down in Pinery area, 
uh, you're looking probably more at a deciduous forest type, like a dry, fresh oak deciduous forest, for example. Um, red oak, white oak, um, red maple, white pine, black cherry are common, bracken fern, canopy cover variable, and then you know it, it goes on like this. So this code would be FOD1 or FODM. So if you're not already confused, <laughs> we're just going to go back up to that thousand foot level. I just wanted to give you a little example of this cool guide. Um, it takes some training to figure it out, but it's a really handy guide if you want to get down into that rabbit hole. So on Lake Huron's coastal uh, fringe, which is from the shoreline to two kilometers inland, we have about 10 coastal ecosystems. So this is a beautiful drawing that shows some of them. We have a sand beach, we have a river mouth, uh, the near shore, which is the water down to six meters in depth, bluffs and gullies, uh, woodlands, cobble beaches, alvars, um, wetlands, woodlands, bedrock shores. I think I hit them all. There's a coastal wetland down there. And we actually looked at all of these 10 coastal ecosystems in our coastal action plan in 2019. We created a fact sheet for each one. So if you're interested in reading a little bit more about each coastal ecosystem, these are available on our website um, under resources. So you can check those out. They tell you about the different threats and stressors that are associated, uh, ecological services, and then some best management practices that go along with these. So we have a ton of resources on our website to check out. So through that information, um, if you consider your soil zone or what, what substrate you're on, what forest zone you're in, so that transition zone, the lowland or the Carolinian, and then what ecosystem type, so are you on a bedrock shore, are you in a, a coastal forest, coastal wetland, you should know what profile you have. So these are examples just of, of different forests along the shoreline. So this one on the left is from Bruce Peninsula. This one in the middle is from Maitland Woods and Goderich. And then this one um, on the right hand side is from Pinery. So you can be in a forest, but that forest can look uh, completely different depending on what area of the shoreline you're in. And Lake Huron has over 6,000 kilometers of shoreline. So it's hard, it's hard to know um, exactly what prescription to give for each person just based on saying forest, you know. Um, and so now we're going to talk about um, how you can take your profile and then adapt it from there. And we all start somewhere, whether we have been on the shoreline for 20 years or whether we just got here this year. Um, you can start with um, a, a degraded ecosystem or an ecosystem that is supposed to be um, like a natural dune environment that's been developed, or you can start with a massive natural dune. Either way, we're all starting somewhere and, uh, and it's good to, to just go from there, especially when we have a year like this year where we have a lot of change just naturally from uh, the lake levels. So going back to that thousand foot level, um, plant anatomy, we have coniferous plants or plants that are evergreen, they last all year long, um, they retain their needles or leaves, and then we have deciduous trees, they're broadleaf, um, they shed their leaves each fall, and um, this applies for shrubs and plants too. So with all kinds of plants, they have two different types of root systems, just looking broadly at this. Uh, some have a tap root, so if you think about a dandelion or a burdock plant, you try and pull it out and there's that long tap root that goes in, or you have fibrous roots. And these are more widespread, they usually go outwards like this. And uh, fibrous roots are more often found in areas with soil that is um, more permeable. So, or even bedrock shores that have less soil because the taproot can't penetrate through bedrock most of the time. So this applies for small plants and also for trees. So some trees like oak trees have a taproot whereas maple trees have more of a fibrous root system. And then if we look up to this diagram here, we have um, an example of canopy cover. Sorry, I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> and um, so we have the canopy cover and then the fibrous root system that extends uh, two to three times past that canopy. But some plants, their root system will stop at the drip line. Um, and this, this information will come in handy in a minute. 
So for deep rooting plants, you know, you can have plants that don't have a tap root that are still deep rooting and those plants are great on slopes or aggressively erodible shorelines because they will really get settled in there and help um, protect the plant from massive erosion from lakeshore changes or even from human disturbance. And they're often recommended for soil solidification, so holding that soil in place. They're not great on things like septic tanks or drain fields or near fragile home infrastructure um, because they can permeate through the different drainage and foundations that exist. But we often recommend native plants because native plants have a deeper rooting um, system than non-native plants. And you can see that in this diagram here. So you can do something as simple as just changing a species and it can drastically influence uh, how much uh, erosion control potential that that plant in that space takes up. So a little highlight on the septic tanks and drain fields. Um, it is recommended to use shallow rooted herbaceous plants that are well adapted to normal rainfall amounts. Um, so we have some examples of those over here. I know there's a lot of text on this slide. Um, plants that have aggressive or woody, water loving deep roots like tap roots, um, they can potentially, oh, sorry, they can potentially clog or disrupt the pipes in the system, causing damage that can be very expensive. And then you'd have to get someone to come and pull up some of the pipes and unclog them. So uh, these examples here are all native and they are, um, that shallow rooting herbaceous plant. They're perennial, so they come back every year, and most of them actually act as uh, pollinator species as well, like butterfly weed, uh, the spotted joe pie weed is great, and then white baneberry is great. It has these little white berries that birds love in the late summer, fall. And then more shade tolerant species like down here, fringed polygala, I think it used to be called gay wings, that's how I know it by. Um, trout lily is another shade loving species, but if you have that full sun, you're probably going to look towards the butterfly weed, um, spotted joe pie weed, baneberry, wild ginger, and bracken fern. So seeing how much light that site gets also affects what species will thrive. So when we're talking about those 10 coastal ecosystems again, and we look at what plants suit those ecosystems, that changes things as well. So for dune plants, we actually have two dune planting guides available for free on our website. One of them is the, the dune planting guide, the wise stewardship of Lake Huron Coastal Dunes. This one's fantastic. Um, I don't have a copy in my hands right now, but it provides immense detail, um, which we'll go through in the next few slides. But there's also this guide, the Lake Huron Coastal Plant Guide, dune plant, dune plant guide. And it has, it's a little bit dated, I guess, but it has photographs and information in each one of these. Um, we don't have, I think we only have like three in, in hand, like printed copies of this, but I think it's available on our website. And it's fantastic um, for someone who wants to really get into the, into the weeds, we can say, on uh, different dune plants. But this dune planting guide here is great. Um, it's a shorter guide. We have a lot printed in our office, or in, we're now virtual, but we can, we can provide them. Um, but they're also available digitally. So here's some examples of dune plants that work really well. Um, and in this guide, it's kind of separated into different types of applications of the plants. So living fences, or if you're planting um, kind of more of a, a low wind break. These are plants that would be recommended like sand cherry, prickly wild rose, common juniper. This is a, uh, a coniferous plant so it'll last all year round. Bearberry is great, it's a beautiful plant. And then shrubby sink foil to get some of those flowers. It also has examples for septic fields. So again, here's some more examples of native plant species that you can put in those areas. And then it even breaks it down into summer, fall, and spring flowering plants. So if you wanted to mix it up to make sure that you have pollinator habitat all year round, or if you wanted to have um, just more color on your dune, uh, examples are provided in this guide. So it's a really awesome guide. Actually, Beach Pea um, 
I don't think is recommended for some areas, but it specifies that more in the, in the guide. So at the end of this guide, it also has an invasive plants list or plants that should not exist on a dune. And often these are garden escapees like periwinkle or lily of the valley, garlic mustard, which is a invasive, strong invasive plant, even in coastal forests. And then um, rare and at risk species. So if you see these, it's really important to protect those and, and even um, let your local conservation authority or the province know if you have these because uh, some of them are very, very rare, like pitcher thistle and lakeside daisy, Ontario blazing star. These are all um, really special and rare species. So moving on to bluffs, we have a coastal bluff native plants guide on our website as well. And it breaks down uh, different trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants. Um, their use, what type of habitat they thrive in, and then um, how to identify that plant. Most of these are native, they're easily accessible at garden centers, um, or you can even just find them in densely uh, wooded areas or densely populated areas of your neighbors locally. So trembling aspen is a really good one because it's very fast growing. Um, it has a lovely sound. It provides great shade and it can take some abuse on the shoreline like those high winds. Uh, white birch, eastern white cedar, basswood, and sugar maple, they're all really good for those erodible sh uh, shorelines on the southern eastern shores. For, for trees, um, for shrub areas, red osier dogwood, choke cherry, and common juniper are highly recommended. Like here it says, uh, I tried to write some of the benefits. So red osier dogwood is great for birds, uh, choke cherries has an extensive root mass, and it's also great for birds. And then the herbaceous layer at the bottom, the wild strawberry is great pollinator plant, bearberry, oh, sorry. Uh, butterfly and bird gardens. It's great in, in those and on dunes. And then Canadian bunchberry is one of my favorites. It's so cute and it's great for woodland gardens or even on uh, septic fields. So when we're talking about forest plants and I've been using the word canopy and shrub layer and ground cover or herbaceous layer, um, that's kind of defined in these layers here. So our canopy, our trees that are at the very top, they take the direct sunlight the sub canopy, this bee layer that takes indirect sunlight, or it's usually more juvenile species of the canopy. And then the understory, which is here, that's your shrub and sapling layer. And then the ground cover is your herbaceous layer. Um, it's usually, you know, up to a foot. Uh, and so forests are defined as more than 60% tree cover whereas woodlands are 35% to 60% tree cover and then savannas are 25 to 35% cover. So how you define that is you walk into the ecosystem and you look up at the sky and you see how much of the sky is covered with tree branches and leaves. So if you can only see 40% uh, or less of open sky, then you're in a forest. Um, and then deciduous forests are defined by having um, deciduous trees as over 75% of the canopy. Coniferous forests are over 75% of the canopy. And a mixed forest is deciduous and coniferous are both less than 25% of the canopy. So defining what kind of forest you're in has to take all these things into account as well. So you could be in a forest or a woodland or a savanna, but you could have trees. So. Knowing that will also help you pick what species work best for your ecosystem. And different forests have different plants because of this and because of the amount of light that permeates down to that herbaceous layer. So this is on the left is an example of the Carolinian forest. So this is a spring water conservation area. I used to frequent this a lot when I was growing up. Um, very Carolinian um, beech and maple and oak are very common. Whereas this forest is the boreal transition forest up in Killarney. So it's very common to have maple again, uh, pine, and even oak, some oak species, but they look very similar. They're both forests and neither of them are wrong, but they just have a different composition of species. Coastal wetlands are really unique to our Great Lakes because some of them exist 
right on the lake shore, like Brucedale Conservation Area. Um, and some of them exist within that two kilometer fringe of Lake Huron shoreline. So if you think about L Lake near Port Franks, uh, Grand Bend area, that's a great coastal wetland. So if you are within two kilometers of Lake Huron shoreline and you live on a wetland, then believe it or not, it is a coastal wetland as defined by the province. Um, the Ontario Wetland Evaluation System is what defines and protects coastal wetlands. And actually coastal wetlands on the Great Lakes have added protections just based on the fact that they feed in to the water quality of the lake. So there's four different types of wetlands that we identify in Ontario, marsh, swamp, fens, and bogs. And the most common that we see are marshes and swamps, especially in um, the lower Great Lakes Basin. But fens and bogs are more peat dominant, nutrient poor, and they exist um, in that transition zone on the eastern Georgian Bay region and then up on the North Shore. They're more common. And so here we see deciduous trees, coniferous, robust emergence or like cattails, things that emerge out of the water and then submergence are things that live under the water here. So coastal wetlands are amazing diverse areas, but they're also really, really at risk from invasive species. So they have this dichotomy of having really rare species at risk that need protecting and then they're also a hot spot for a lot of invasive species. So this uh, picture comparison here it is both Bruce Dale Conservation Area uh, that Saugeen Valley Conservation manages and this whole mass of plant here is all Phragmites australis, this, the invasive Phragmites plant. And you can see two canoes here and some people for scale. And it took, I think, three years to clear all that Phragmites out of the bay and restore it back to the coastal wetland that it is. This took hundreds of thousands of dollars, an immense amount of labor and partnerships with the local community to undertake this scale. And I know that the uh, Lambton Shores Phragmites Working Group has done amazing work in Port Franks as well. Uh, but these examples of invasive species to be on the lookout for, it's really important to catch them early so that it's not as expensive and time consuming to remove these patches. So if you see um, roots of Phragmites washing up like we saw this spring, it's really important to get those because they may still be alive and they can start taking root on your shore and just they take over in a year. Purple loosestrife is another one that was really common a few years ago in, uh, in the news. But then these other ones, these submergent species like fanwort, paired feather, and water hyacinth, um, they are actually in the water and are harder to identify if you're not a real plant nerd, a real botanist. And then there's other ones down here like the zebra mussel, the rusty crayfish, round goby. They're all um, fish and aquatic species, but that are very heavily established. So it's really hard to control these kind of populations in coastal wetlands. Alvar plants. So alvars are really cool. If you don't know what they are, they are um, a ecosystem type that is dominated by shallow soils, bedrock, and they're actually extremely rare in the world. So we have them on the Bruce Peninsula and even at the Massasauga Provincial Park along the Bruce Peninsula. And the other areas that they exist are Sweden and um, the Scandinavian countries, but they're very, very unique and sensitive ecosystems. So we have five different alvar types. And again, it's important to know if you are on an alvar, which type you're on. So these pavement alvars like this image down here, um, shrubland alvars, uh, savanna alvars. So again, we're talking about savannas, woodlands and forests. So alvar woodlands down here, they have a higher tree cover than pavement alvars. Um, but these alvars are home to, again, some really rare cool species uh, and some very, very common species as well, like white cedar, white spruce. Um, but then they also host rare species like Lakeside Daisy. So this is an example uh, of species at risk in Ontario that solely exists really on Lake Huron's coastal corridor. So this is the Dwarf Lake Iris. You can see a beautiful photo. This is off of the Government of Ontario website. 
it's special concern, so it's not yet threatened or endangered, but it's getting there. And um, it's a low growing flowering plant, about 10 centimeters high, so uh, you know, very small, easy to trample if you aren't paying attention, and especially when it's not in bloom. And it spreads mainly by underground roots that sprout new plants. So it doesn't really spread through wind like a lot of plant species. Their seeds are spread by ants. So that's why these populations are dense and in small isolated areas, which makes them even more, um, even more vulnerable. So in Ontario, dwarf lake iris grow on sand or thin soil over limestone bedrock, um, but they also occur in cedar swamps forested sand dunes, and alvars. So although they're a very rare, unique plant, they can grow in three different coastal ecosystems. So it's important to understand that um, even if you live in a, a coastal woodland, um, you're not immune to getting these other rare species that frequent alvars or coastal wetlands. So, that being said, it's, it's really important to have these identification skills for rare plants so that you can identify them on your property and then protect them from there. So now hopefully we know what our ecosystem type is, like coastal wetland, woodland, bluff, gully, sand beach, what our growing season is, so based on, on your plant hardiness zone, and then how do we re restore our shore from there or restore our properties. So these slides are a bit text heavy, but um, they're the best management practices that I could come up with. So if you have a lawn on your property, um, it's best to reduce them where possible. Using turf grass is actually a non-native species and it attracts geese like crazy. <laughs> um, using natural vegetation along the shore, like even a, a small shrub layer or just not cutting like two meters from the shore edge will extremely help the water quality in that near shore and it will reduce the geese coming up on your lawn because the geese are scared of the tall grass because they think predators are lurking within. Uh, so dogwoods, asters, and dune grass are great for this. Uh, letting your lawn grow a bit longer, so you know over two to three inches, actually reduces the need for irrigation. So it helps reduce uh, your water use and improves the water quality in the near shore again because there's probably less runoff. And then of course av avoiding chemical fertilizers and the use of Roundup. So even now um, one of my colleagues was at their cottage on the weekend and somebody was spraying Roundup like two feet from the shoreline. That Roundup is going right into the water and killing a lot of different um, in water aquatic species that's not their intention to hurt those species, but it just naturally goes right into the lake. So understanding that everything flows into the lake, it's important and it's also the law. So if you see somebody who's using chemical fertilizers or Roundup, you can report it to the Ontario Spills Action Center. Um, and that number is easily uh, found on Google if you just Google that phone number. And you can, you can report the use of that chemical or pesticide because ultimately um, maintaining the water quality of Lake Huron is all of our responsibility. So with septic systems, like most of the shoreline on Lake Huron is privately owned and most of us have septic systems. So main, making sure that you're maintaining your septic system on a regular basis is really important. So you're supposed to clean out the filters at least once a year and you're supposed to have them emptied every five years. Like I know when I moved into my house, it hadn't been cleaned out for almost 30 years and it was almost solid. Um, we have ours cleaned out every five years. It only costs between $100 and $200, depending on your location. And it's just part of the maintenance cost of having a septic system. So we have to understand that um, we have to maintain these things properly. And I know that uh, some of our other partner organizations have septic system um, programs where you can have a, um, oh, what do you call those? Like somebody come out and they look to see how, how healthy your septic tank is. So for tips for septic systems, vegetating them on the top with plants other than grass, like we talked about butterfly weed or other pollinator species, those shallow soft rooting plants that will really help provide extra habitat in an area that's probably not being used or it's underutilized. You want to place these septic systems as far back from the shore as possible. So 
in um, my experience, my, at my family's cottage, we had a septic system that was from probably the 60s or 50s, and it was like 15 meters from the shore, and we actually moved it all up to the other side of our cottage between the cottage and the road so that it would reduce the impact when it needed to be replaced. So just because it's always existed there doesn't mean you have to keep it there, you can move it farther back. And that's something that we recommend uh, draining away from the shore. I mean, eventually it'll get, all that water will get to the shore, but if it can filter through as much material as possible, that is ideal. Using water saving devices inside your home or even around your home to reduce that loading to the septic will enhance its uh, workability immensely. So if that's uh, water saving toilets or taps, and then avoiding septic additives or using caustic cleaners in the home. So when we actually just did a kitchen renovation here and uh, we got stone countertops and I said, you know, can I use vinegar and water to clean this? He said, no, literally soap and water. That's all you should use. And that shocked me because <laughs> I'm used to using more heavy duty cleaners, right? But the soap and water does a great job. Um, so rethinking what kind of cleaners we use and how that all ends up entering our septic tank and then into our lake. Those are all really important considerations just for septic systems and uh, lake health. So when we're talking about natural landscaping, um, you wanna work with nature. So you wanna, if you're building something new, you wanna keep as many existing trees or shrubs or plants on your property as possible to reduce that impact. It takes over 20 years to reestablish a tree to get the benefits that an existing tree already provides. So even just tweaking uh, a shed placement slightly in order to keep a tree or to reduce the footprint of that house by a foot so you can keep trees. That will immensely help both the environment and your heating and cooling bill. So it's been shown that planting deciduous trees on the west side of your house where that sun sets and it gets really hot in the summer, deciduous trees will shade your house reducing your cooling costs. And if you put coniferous trees or evergreens on the north side or the shore side of your house, it protects your house from winter winds, which then reduces your heating costs. So you can use these type of ecosystem services in order to benefit your pocketbook and the environment. You wanna water your landscape only as needed. So right now we're actually in a drought. We have had two weeks of sun, hot, hot sun. Um, and so you will see very quickly in these times which species are more drought tolerant than others. And a lot of native species are more drought tolerant and they're better applied uh, in, your, in, in your landscaping and environment. So these native species will reduce maintenance and need for watering and pesticides and um, miracle Grow type products. Then uh, when we look at dunes and shore vegetation on sand beaches or cobble beaches, if that's where you live, um, Planting dune grass and other dune species will actually reduce erosion further inland, acting as that buffer zone. So keeping it in place is really important or replanting it in areas that have had disturbance or, or removal of plants. That's important, very, very important. And right now, the waves coming up and removing that dune grass, it might not be intentional that the dune grass has been removed, but replacing it as, as you can or encouraging it to replace itself. Um, will help with that natural landscaping and provide you with the ecosystem service of erosion control. So reducing hardening around your property is also a, a great practice. And I'm not talking about shoreline hardening here. I'm talking about like paved and impervious surfaces. So keeping these to a minimum, um, you can switch like an asphalt driveway to a interlocked stone driveway that helps with the permeability of rain going from the atmosphere and then instead of running off an asphalt driveway, it permeates through interlock brick. Um, gravel driveways are even good for this, opposed to a paved driveway. And it minimizes um, runoff that goes across the landscape and ends up eroding the topsoil off the top of our landscape. So if you live on a bluff, this is really important to be aware of because you want to reduce the amount of overflow erosion. You want to increase water filtration uh, directing eaves troughs outflows into rain gardens, rain barrels, or gravel to drain safely. So rain gardens can be absolutely beautiful um, and you can have these kind of cobbly gardens that help uh, infiltrate water. 
And then removing old shoreline hardening structures. So this is talking about like those groins or seawalls and encouraging natural regeneration will be more effective protection in the long run. And we did another webinar on this um, a few months ago now. So knowing your weeds from your native edge, just being up to date, having guides like the coastal plant guide at home or even just like general plant identification guides are really important to reducing the spread of invasive species, protecting species at risk, and um, just generally having good management strategies for a native ecosystem in your home or around your home. So removing non-natives from gardens and shoreline, like hostas are non-native, but they're also not really invasive, but there's other better options out there, like we talked about, and like that's available in these kind of guides. Um, we're discouraging opportunists. This is like periwinkle is an opportunist. If it is allowed to escape from the garden and thrive, it will just completely take over. Reporting large outbreaks of non-natives to local authorities like your conservation authority or your municipality to get help with their removal if needed. So if the patch has gone out of control and it's kind of above your capability of removing it, there's help available and there's budgets available through different agencies that can help you remove these species. And only remove what's needed. So again, talking about the benefits of a tree and losing that tree simply to gain a foot of a building. Um, only remove what is absolutely needed to be removed. And of course, follow, follow your regulations and bylaws. In some place, there are tree cutting bylaws in place. So one more uh, general best management practice, this is the last one, is giving haircuts, not decapitations. So if you have your cottage and then a row of trees and shrubs and then the shoreline, but you wanna get rid of those trees and shrubs because you wanna see the sunset, you wanna see the horizon, or you wanna see your kids at the beach, um, pruning the trees and shrubs to give you a better view, but also keeping that tree in place to have all the benefits of having that tree are better than just lopping off the entire top of the tree. Um, it'll provide more shade, more ecological um, quality for different migratory species and habitat. So pruning those trees to get your small visage so you can still see the horizon, but you're maintaining the integrity of that tree. That's important. Uh, provincially and federally, a uh, width of 15 to 30 meters of vegetation between the shore to inland is ideal. So this could be trees from the shoreline all through your cottage area and all the way to the road even. But that is, is the recommended width of vegetation. So not a development regulation. This is just the recommended buffer of vegetation. Using winding paths through vegetation buffers. So whether you're on a coastal forest, an alvar, a dune, having your set path that you use to reduce all these other small paths will reduce impacts and it will also improve the integrity of the environment and the compaction of soil. And then remember that it, it takes decades to replace lost, lost ecosystems. So think before you cut, whether you're on a dune or coastal forest or an alvar, um, any damage that is done will take decades to, to replace. So these are two examples of uh, landscaping on the shoreline. This one obviously is the bad one because there's grass almost up to the shore edge with some rocks. So the geese are going to love this area and they're going to end up pooping all over these stones unfortunately. It's going to take a ton of irrigation to keep that grass beautiful and they have absolutely no wind protection. So their heating bills in the winter time are going to go up. Whereas in this side, this is a good example where you still have your nice solidified pathway to the shore. You have native species, you have some ferns here, you've kept all the trees, you have pruned your trees up so you can still see out into the shore, um, but you have a better wind buffer so you won't have as, as high of heating and cooling costs for your home. So there are a ton of native plant species resources out there. I'm going to go over a few of them quickly, but this will all be on, um, on the webinar recording so you can refer back to it later. This guide is my absolute favorite guide to refer people to. It's called the Grow Me Instead Guide and it's by the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. Uh, if you go to ontarioinvasiveplants.ca or if you just google Grow Me Instead Guide, it gives you an example of periwinkle or lily of the valley, some plants that are very common. And then it gives you example of um, 
things that you can replace that with. So in this case, wild geranium or starry Solomon seal. So these plants are comparable in the environments that they grow, but one is unwanted or invasive and the other one is native and it will do a lot better. So instead of me rambling off all the species that are good, check out this guide. There's one for Southern Ontario and one for Northern Ontario, depending on where you are on Lake Huron shoreline. They go over those ground covers, trees and shrubs, uh, and everything in between. Amazing guides. The next one is the Ontario Native Plants website. So this one, um, you can actually order plants through their website and they're delivered right to you, which is great during these type of times. Their website is onplants.ca and you can shop by, you know, type of plants. So wildflowers, ferns and grasses, trees, edible fruits, or you can also shop by the light that it gets in that area, the moisture and your soil type. So this is a really, really great resource even to look at different plants that are good for different light types or, or soil types. Landscape Ontario also has a, some really great resources there. Um, you can find out some design ideas, your style, or just inspiration and tips to make your garden more pollinator friendly and they provide some species lists there. So check out landscapeontario.com for this resource. And then if you're looking for more of those um, identification guides, the Ontario Trees and Shrubs website is excellent. And again, it, it provides trees and shrubs by habitat, um, alien and native species, when their flowering season is, the flower color, like you name it, this is a really good online resources and they are available at ontariotrees.com. And um, second last, this is the Healthy Landscapes plant list and it's through the University of Guelph and they have an amazing arboretum through the University of Guelph. They're very well known for their plant knowledge. So this is an example of the Healthy Landscapes guide for full sun native plants. And you have perennials, grasses, vines, trees, and shrubs. Um, knowing the Latin name, which is what this is, is really important when you go to a garden center because um, common names or things like butterfly weed. There could be three plants that are called butterfly weed, but if you have that Latin name, it really helps you pinpoint the exact native species that you're looking for. So this is um, accessible. It's easiest if you just Google University of Guelph Healthy Landscapes plant list, and it comes up with full sun, shade, mixed, uh, and it's available through the University of Guelph website. And then if you're looking, we often get the question, where do I buy these plants? Do you have like a, a nursery list for the area? And we don't have a nursery list for the area. Uh, this is what we typically refer to is the Society for Ecological Restoration's Native Plant Species Growers List. And so it shows you different companies, their address, their contact info, and then what kind of plants that they provide. And they're all, mostly all of them have websites. So a chorus, Baker Nursery, you know, you can go through and then kind of cut back to what your area and where you locally are. Uh, this is the website that I got it off of oakvillegreen.org. And then of course our website, we have all these free resources for your, uh, for your, for you available at any time of the day. That dune planting guide is here. The coastal bluff native plants guide is here, but then we also have ones that are specifically tailored to certain areas of the coast, like here, Saugeen Shores, um, Port Franks, uh, here on Kinloss, King Carden. So even if you're not from King Carden, you can still look at the King Carden guide and it will provide you with great information. Um, but all of these are available under our resources tab here and then stewardship plans and guides. So now I'm sure that some of you will have some questions. So I'm open to questions. Um, I hope that that was kind of a good overview of plants and how to identify what type of area you're in and then um, make plant choices based on that. So uh, I also wanna mention that we are not doing site visits at this time. So we won't come out to your specific shore and help you pick plants. We're not a landscaping company by any means. But if you do work with a landscaper, you can always take what you've learned or use your guides and then talk to them about different native plant species that you'd like to incorporate into your design. So I will open it up for questions. Uh, if you're familiar with the Zoom software, there is a question and answer area. Um, and I think there's also a chat. So uh, feel free to ask. Um, Eileen, she asks, how do they best remove Phragmites? 
We have some guides on our website uh, for how to remove Phragmites. There's a shoveling technique, um, but it's hard because Phragmites will grow on land and in the water. So currently you're not allowed to spray Phragmites with Roundup or any kind of chemical because it'll affect the water quality. So in large sites like at Port Franks and in Brucedale Conservation Area, we used a what's called a truck sore and it's this giant amphibious cutting machine. It's kind of like a combine, but uh, for in the water. It's amazing. It's a Swedish device. So that's best to remove in large sections. But if you're just hand bombing small sections on your property, cutting it out with a shovel, making sure you get as many of the roots as possible because they are they spread underground via their rhizomes. Um, so making sure you get absolutely all of it put it in a brown paper bag and then burn it. That is the best way to um, kill all the seeds and the seed heads. So if you can't dig it up, but the seed heads are gonna start coming out right now, cutting off the seed heads will at least slow the growth for now. Um, yes, Eileen actually just said that too. <laughs> Cutting the seed heads helps slow it down, but the best way, and uh, in the spring too, the new shoots will come up and they're only about that big and you can just go around with, um, some like Felco pruners or something or shears and cut them off uh, if you can't take the big the big stalks because the stalks can get up to like a toony wide thick. They're immense amount of vegetation you have to remove. So um, there's some resources on our website like I mentioned under the Bruce Dale project tab or you can check out the Lambton Shores Phragmites working group. They have some really good resources on their website too specifically on removal and the techniques that they used. You have any other questions? Is there anything else that you guys wanted me to expand on at all? It's hard to fit all the stuff about plants into one hour. Oh, um, would you plant anything in the water? You can, if you live on a coastal wetland, and you want to increase a certain plant species, like a native plant species in the water, um, you can get some native plant species. But you want to be very, very careful with what plant species you introduce because they are harder to identify. And there's tons of identification guides that you can pick up for aquatic plant species. Um, but if they are misidentified and it's a non-native or invasive species, it can absolutely take over. So. Um, you can plant things in the water in coastal wetlands, but you just want to make sure you're very careful with with knowing that Latin name is the correct Latin name and that the the nursery you're getting them from is reputable. Ah, yes, somebody says uh, MNRF has a management plan for Phragmites. So they do. Um, with all species at risk in Ontario, those are the rare species, they usually have uh, critical habitat management guides. So if you have, for example, Massasauga rattlesnakes on your property, they're an endangered species. Um, you can look at that critical habitat guide and see how you can better improve your habitat to cater to that specific species. Um, on the flip side, for invasive species, most municipalities and the MNRF, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, will have management plans to help reduce uh, the presence of those invasive species in our province and in our area. So you can refer to those as well if you know you have that invasive species on your property. And you can even see in those guides and management plans what is appropriate or how it's appropriate to remove those. So. For example, with the Phragmites in the water, it's not okay to spray Roundup on them. And that is described. Uh, and they actually give best management practices for how to remove those properly in, in whatever coastal ecosystem you're in. So if you know you have an invasive species, you can go on uh, to the Ontario website, look up that invasive species or invadingspecies.com, and they will have um, more resources specifically on each species. Okay, so I think I will end it there. Um, if you have any other questions specifically about um, different species or projects that the Coastal Center is working on, like our Green Ribbon Champion Restoration Program, 
You can find those on our website, lakehuron.ca, or you can send us an email at coastalcenter at lakehuron.ca. And we love hearing your feedback or what you liked or didn't like about these webinars. It's really great. We have two more coming up for the year uh, in the next few weeks. So uh, we would love to see you at these next upcoming ones. Um, otherwise, feel free to give us a, a contact at this information below. Um, so I will stop it there. Thank you everyone so much for attending and um, we will be seeing you soon. Okay, thank you so much.